Thank you, Adam. Uh, as said, I'm Timmy. Um, I'm a little hyped up on caffeine and sugar right now. Um, so if I start jumping up and down, relax, it's okay. It's, it's normal for me. Um, I'm a member of the jQuery team, as he said, and I mostly help out with core development. I've rewritten Sizzle a few times, um, and I've done some other stuff that I won't mention. Um, I'm going to talk about the future of selectors, and there are some really cool things happening. By the way, slides are available um, at that URL there, timmywill.github.io slash reveal.js. Um, that's what I used to build it. That's just a temporary URL that won't stay there. Um, but first, it would be helpful, I think, to provide a little history of CSS selectors before we discuss their future. Um, the first CSS specification was published in 1996. Is that showing up? It's not showing up. One second. It's not switching with me. Most CSS selectors uh, that we know and love today were part of the 2.1 spec, which went in and out of official recommendation by the W3C between 2004 and 2011. Drafts of CSS3 were available in 1999, before 2.1 even reached recommendation status. But it became apparent that CSS needed to be more modular. It was getting too big, so they split it up into several pieces that could be worked on separately. There are almost 80 CSS modules today, um, at least four of which have been published as formal recommendations, including Selectors Level 3, which is the current selector spec. CSS 4 has continued the modularity trend and the exciting selectors level four uh, represents the selectors module of CSS4 and is still under development. That's a quick rundown of CSS selectors. What about in JavaScript? I doubt we could talk about the history of JavaScript selectors without starting with Simon Willison's, great last name by the way, uh, get elements by selector. It was a short script that gathered elements using get elements by tag name and matched according to a CSS selector. It could do uh, class matching before there was get elements by class name, uh, attribute matching, and simple selectors like ID and tag. Uh, the little script was part of the inspiration for jQuery and inspired other projects, including one you might remember called behavior.js and, of course, prototype. Then came, oh, wrong way, there we go. CSS Query by Dean, Edward, Dean Edwards, which in addition to the selectors supported by get elements by selector, also supported some pseudo selectors like first child and last child. Not surprisingly, John Resig had been following the trend of JavaScript selectors and had, its own, and had his own ideas. Um, in 2005, he released a little project called JSelect, which was the precursor to jQuery, and finally jQuery itself in January 2006 at Barcamp. Keep doing that, sorry. Four days after that, Prototype released their engine. Three months after that, the precursor to MooTools, and now we're off to the races. Uh, jQuery continued to release major performance improvements. Um, Sizzle was separated from jQuery as a selector module that was um, meant to be incorporated into any JavaScript library, uh, of which Prototype took advantage uh, at some point, and other 
engines were published, dojo.query, base2, ext, yui 2.4, and the awesome NW matcher. But uh, right around the time yui 2.4 and NW matcher were being written, query selector all was published in a working draft in October 2007, and that changed everything. Um, in 2008, John wrote a blog post when all the JavaScript libraries were starting to use query selector all in preparation for it, um, uh, for it reaching recommendation status. He noted that there is one thing undeniable about it. Sorry, it's cut off. Um, resolution's a little, a little off. Um, it is extraordinarily fast. It sped up all the libraries that incorporated it. So sometimes I get asked, why do we even need sizzle? Why can't we just use query selector all? Well, bottom line, um, I don't recommend it unless you know all of the differences and the pitfalls, um, but you can right now. With the release of jQuery 2.0 uh, came a build option to replace Sizzle with a fired file called uh, selectornative.js. It's a little file that Richard Gibson wrote. Um, it simply maps all your selectors to use query selector all or the matches selector API instead, but there's just a few warnings when you use it. Um, putting aside selector extensions or reliable sorting of elements based on document order, um, it could never fully replace a selector engine. Even if it didn't have any bugs and worked perfectly in every browser, um, which it doesn't, um, and I'll tell you why. The spec itself has had a major issue since the beginning, and that's the scope issue. While the results of an element-rooted call to query selector and query selector all are limited to the descendants of the element, the context object, the selector itself is not relative to that object. So um, I know that was a long explanation, but let me give you an example. There we go. So for our purposes, just pay attention to the HTML in this section and uh, this paragraph element outside the section. That's all the HTML in the, in the document. So let's start with a simple one. Uh, document query selector all, select all the P tags. There's three, so that works great. There's Three paragraph elements, Bob one, Bob two, and outside. Okay, let's do an element rooted query. I'm gonna do my fancy DevTools shortcut here. Um, post one is simply assigned to that first article there. So I'm gonna get Bob one inside post one, that paragraph element. That works fine, but let's do something else. Let's try post one, not query selector all, section B. You see there's no section in the first article, but when I execute this, it still finds Bob one. Um, it's not really intuitive, but that's what it does, it works. The selector itself is not relative to post one, it's always relative to the root, um, even though the descendants are limited to uh, the, the descendants of post one. Um, let's do one more example, make it even clearer here. What if I start with a combinator? That's, uh, that's the next combinator, or sorry, uh, immediate descendant throws an exception. It doesn't even understand that. It won't even use root as, uh, as the context. Starting with the combinator, combinator is invalid. So we fix this in sizzle, 
by attaching the ID of the element. If it has one, and if it doesn't have one, we make one up just for the duration of the selection. And then it works. So you see there's little differences um, between query selector all and uh, jQuery's find. When the spec for query selector all was, uh, was being reviewed, all of the JavaScript libraries opposed this behavior. John Rezig said, this is completely unacceptable. Not only is it not intuitive, finding elements that don't match the correct expression, but it goes against what every JavaScript library prov provides. Alex Russell, the creator of Dojo's selector engine, said, uh, this is a spec bug. And it was. So how did it end up that way? Well, the selectors API was written after CSS selectors were already available. CSS had, had, had no concept of scope in selectors, um, so why should JavaScript? However, with the introduction of the scoped attribute for, for style tags in HTML5, CSS adopted the concept of scope. In the next revision of the selectors API, we should have a solution for this, but uh, before I get to that, let me tell you a little bit about what's coming up. There are some highlights in uh, selectors level four that I wanna show you. Matches. Uh, the matches selector is basically the opposite of not. The biggest fan advantage I've seen so far um, is you get easier selector combinations. For instance, uh, we've all done this. Let me get my... That's here. Um, combining different pseudos for anchor tags. With matches, it's just one compound selector. It's not a selector list. And... It matches all anchor tags that are link, visited, hover, active. And I'm sure there are so many more applications for this. Um, maybe match an input if it's the target or if it has focus. Maybe a div if it's being animated, if it's visible or if it's the main one. Um, and, then there's, right. and then there's reference combinators. Um, the most obvious reason for the addition of this selector is due to the close and loving relationship between labels and inputs. Reference combinators allow to make use of attributes that reference other elements. So put a style on the input that is referenced in the for attribute of the label, uh, which is pretty cool. You can get creative and reference other attributes, even data attributes. Make reference another element using your own selector and use that to put a style on some other element. And there's finally a notation, and I'm pointing at the wrong slide, uh, for case insensitive attribute values. Um, match the value of an attribute selector without having to create a filter function or tediously account for every acceptable combination of lowercase and uppercase letters in the value. Any link and local link are two little selectors that are really useful. Um, I'm going to skip them for now. Blank is really awesome. Um, it's uh, really a welcome addition for me because um, it is just like empty, except it excludes white space and new lines. So those text elements won't be counted. That, pe that paragraph element is considered blank, but not empty. And then there's nth match and nth last match. You're probably familiar with nth child, um, which is great for alternating styles between the children of, of an element. Well, now you can split, uh, um, split up any selector based on the a n plus b syntax. Um, and there's also nth column and nth last column for column layouts, which will be really useful when uh, grid is, is done. Uh, but Here's the big one. 
Those who've, seen, those who've seen this selector and have given examples of how it could be useful have all started with the same example. I'm sure you've run into this problem. Uh, navigation usually follows this syntax. You have a, a, a nav, a ul, an li, and an anchor tag in HTML5 anyway. Um, but sometimes you don't want to always set styles on the anchor tag on hover. You might want to set it on the list element or even on the um, unordered list wrapper. Um, so notice that little exclamation point prepended to the li. The style will be applied to that li. So on hover of the anchor tag, that li gets a background of gray. On hover of the anchor tag, that ul gets a box shadow. So that's a really big one. Um, that's not the only use case, I'm sure. There's going to be tons. And uh, I just saw an email today. Um, they're talking about allowing exclamation points or more than one. So if you wanted to apply background gray to both the UL and the LI, you can do that. They can both be the subject. It's just going to match both of them. So that's something I'm really excited about. Let me pause for a moment and point out that uh, in the spirit of moving the web forward, as the spec for these selectors is finalized, um, we will be including them e either in Sizzle or in a Sizzle plugin that incorporates these so you can start using them in JavaScript. But there's one more selector I want to talk about. Um, as I said before, one of the major issues in query selector all is that selectors aren't relative. In a selector, the scope pseudo um, refers to either the parent of a scope style element in HTML5, um, an element as in the case of QSA, or simply the document root if none of that applies. This makes the selector relative to the context object. So in our HTML example there, that style element is scoped to the section element, its parent. Um, those two selectors are exactly the same, article, scope, article. In JavaScript, uh, l.querySelectorAll, it won't select anything, which is great. There's no body in L, so why would it you know, match anything? Um, nevertheless, there are still a couple issues. First of all, it doesn't perform very well. Using scope is not incredibly fast. It's probably not going to be a bottleneck for your application, so I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time on that. I, I wouldn't be worried about using it unless you're doing delegation or something like that. Um, but second of all, it only fixes some of our problem. As I've been saying, the spec for query selector and query selector all defines these methods in such a way that limits the set of match elements to the descendants of the context object and only the descendants, meaning you can't match siblings or even ancestors, which selectors level four now enables. Um, so that selector there can never return anything because Siblings of Elam aren't descendants of Elam. <clears throat> so we've talked about the history of selectors in CSS and JavaScript, and I've given you a sneak peek into some of the new selectors in level four. I've explained the scoping problem in the native query selector and query selector all methods and why we can't simply replace, um, or why we can't completely replace all selector engines with QSA. But you know what would be great? Maybe we can convince the spec writers to give us a method that does exactly what we need to replace selector engines. Disregarding selector extensions, um, adding custom selectors like input, pseudo, and stuff, um, because that's probably never going to happen. Uh, if we had a function that always assumed relative selectors without the use of the scope pseudo and could return siblings of the context and ancestors, we might just have something that could completely replace Sizzle's function, selector functionality. But we got it. It's in the spec. And fortunately, the name isn't even very long. You don't even have to type out query selector all. 
It's just find and find all. It's not in a stable browser yet, but it's being specced. Um, the selectors API level two defines the methods find and find all. These methods should behave um, the same way as all the popular JavaScript engines. And once these are implemented in browsers, the only thing left will be custom selectors. And then as John Rezik said, uh, when query selector all came out, everything after this is just gravy. So. <laughs> and I uh, went a little fast because of the caffeine there, so we have, we have lots of time for questions. Um, does anybody have any? No. So when you were talking about, uh, when you did a specific example where you were going from the current object as your reference, and then you were going to the article by ID, and you were selecting the H3, right? Uh huh. And one way you wrote it, you wrote it out, it didn't select, but it CSS, it shouldn't have selected it. Right. So maybe I just misunderstood that part. Were you saying that in the future that would work? In CSS or in jQuery? It works now in jQuery. It's, you're talking about the direct descendant, the... Yeah, it was like the second or third example again. Sorry, I was wild. I didn't want to run. Right. Um, yeah, I'll go back to that example. He's asking if there's a difference between CSS uh, and JavaScript selectors with the direct descendant. Um, let me see. There we go. Um, right, I don't think that would work in CSS. But you could do, um, if you were inside a, a style tag that was scoped, that would work, which is a better analogy for JavaScript, because you're always starting with a context object in JavaScript, and you're not always doing that in CSS. So when you, when you um, I've never seen the post one part before. Yeah, thanks. Uh, what, sorry, I've never seen what you did uh, at the beginning. Where you were. Oh, OK. Right, when you, I've never done that. So, when you did the post one, you were saving the section posts, correct? Or could you, maybe you went through it too fast. Could you walk us through it again? Sure, yeah. When I got post one, it's that first article tag right there. Um, that one there. So not, not the section, it's, it's just that. So I was just dealing with the H3 and the P tag there as descendants. So. Post one is simply that article element. And try, I was trying to retrieve the header that is a direct descendant of post one. OK. Yeah, you must have gone too fast. Okay. Sorry. Um, by the way, scope is in Chrome stable right now. Um, so it actually works there. Any other questions? When do we start using more level four selectors? Um, they're not in any nightly builds right now uh, because they're still changing the syntax a little bit. Uh, the one, like I said, I'm most excited about is subject. And they're still deciding whether the exclamation point should be at the beginning of, of a selector or at the end, stuff like that. So I would say. Within the next year, we should see them coming into browsers. Um, but they'll be coming into um, plugins sooner, so we can start using them and see how they feel. Sizzle. Like Sizzle, right? An ETA? An ETA? <laughs> uh, as soon as I can. <laughs> Uh, yeah, is there any worry about subject uh, negatively impacting browser performance? Especially if you were to have more than one exclamation point on the selectors, because it would have to descend down to figure out if it, you're actually hovering and then kind of descend back up to change the subject style. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it'll hurt performance that much because um, browser implementations of selectors works from right to left and not actually left to right. 
So it selects, um, so in that case, it selects all H3s and then checks their parents to see if they match. So with the subject selector, you just stop. And then you return that instead of the original item. Anybody else? I was just wondering what type of browser support that's going to have. Like, uh, what versions? Is this, this going to go back to like IE 5.5 or something like that? Or would, because <laughs> that's what I'm developing for primarily. <laughs> uh, get out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Sizzle will continue to support IE6+. Plus. I don't think it'll be that hard to implement these new selectors in Sizzle. Um, you, you briefly touched on the ancestor selector. Can you give us a, a demo of what that'll look like, or is that even... Close there, to being. It's, yeah, it's not in a browser right now. That's kind I of a suggestion. I wish I, could, I wish I could demo it. No, um, just just what it would look like, not necessarily actually working. It would just be the reverse of the descendant selector. Or? Ancestor selector. Yeah. Well, that, I was referring to the subject selector, which yeah. that means you could select ancestors. Um, that was in. So there's no actual ancestor selector. Right. Um, there are selectors that allow you that will enable you to select ancestors, like the LI right, is an okay. ancestor of the A tag, so it's selecting an ancestor there. Um, but there's another one, which I showed you, and that's reference combinators. Mm -hmm. That will allow you to select any element on the page, so including ancestors. Right. right. Well, you said I thought there was actually a, no, a new combinator that would go back up. Oh, somehow, a combinator? That would no. Yeah. What uh, what's the logic for using the exclamation mark for the subject thing? That kind of makes it you know I'm used to that being not. So if you use that in a subject, it, I would think you know maybe this would apply to everything but that one. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, um, the not equal extension in Sizzle is not standard CSS. It's not even valid. Uh, it's something we've added. So it. It's a concept that we brought over from other languages. Not is, is or the exclamation point it, uh, means not in other languages. But in CSS, you think of the important thing that you put, on, put at the end of a style. It doesn't actually mean not. It means like emphasized. So that's kind of what they're thinking when they add it there. I want this. Um. With the, uh, the scoping thing, is it possible for us to use that on like a, a link? So when we're bringing in our style sheet, we can say this whole sheet is scoped to this section, or do we have to use it as part of like the, the style tag itself? The scoped attribute? Correct. Right. Right now, that's only valid for style tags. I have kind of a uh, how-to question. We have a single page app that brings in dozens of CSS files. And the problem that we have is you have uh, a new CSS file that comes in that affects a bunch of stuff that it was un unintended to. And it all comes back to the, his discussion about scope. How are people addressing these scope issues now in large applications with lots of components that are bringing lots of CSS files? Um, well, there are several ways, I think. Um, the way Apple.com deals with it is they start anything new with an ID, a special ID for that page or for some section on the page. And then all of the other selectors descend from that ID. And that'd be one way to deal with it. Um, it's, it's tough, though, because um, best practice these days they recommend that you have as little CSS as possible and share everything between classes. But if you have a thousand pages, I mean, I don't want to fit all that into my head. So I think Apple's solution is probably better for really large scale applications. 
Um, it might hurt performance a little bit, but it's going to be easier on the brain. Well, oh, one more. You talked about rewriting Sizzle a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, so what are some techniques you use to get performance in Sizzle to be close or better than rather, you know, find all our queries like all performance? Well, really you can't beat query selector all um, for most selectors, except for simple selectors like ID and tag and class. Sizzle um, will do a quick regex to see if the selector matches any of those three, and then map it to the really quick functions like get element by ID, get elements by class name, get elements by tag name. Um, and if that doesn't work, it goes and passes the selector straight to query selector all. If that throws an exception, it catches it, and then uh, it does the normal sizzle thing from there. So it will get a little bit better performance for um, ID tags because get element by ID uh, for ID selectors because get, ele get element by ID is about 20 times faster than doing an ID selector with query selector all. Um, but most of the time you're talking ops in like 500,000 to, you know, 24 million, which is just ridiculous. Um, so if it's, it, it's, it's micro performance. Um, but most things these days can be passed to query selector all and you don't have to worry about it. It'll be fast enough. One more back there. Hi. In this example of reference combinators, the I see that this is matching um, hover and focus on a label that's for input. Is input the the type of element, or is that an ID? Uh, input is a is a tag selector, so. Um, uh, the CSS spec says that all selectors have to start with a tag or an implied tag. So if it doesn't have a tag, it sticks a star at the beginning. Um, the input is just there to specify what kind of tag. You could put a star there and okay, it still Okay, so work. you could use a class or an ID there also. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And then one other thing. Um, I don't think everybody in the room caught the dollar zero trick that you used in in oh, Chrome sure. DevTools, and I find it to be a real time saver. Maybe you can yeah. go back through it real quick. I can, Thank I, you. I can show that again. I feel like I'm Paul Irish right now. Um. <laughs> you can reference any element that you've selected um, on the elements panel by using um, $0. Actually, I'll just do this, which will save you a lot of time. Um, I think there's another one. I think that is like the previous one that I selected. So, and there's more. Uh, maybe maybe I could do it. I forgot how to list them, but it's on there somewhere. <laughs> Does that work everywhere? It works in DevTools, so just in Chrome. I think. It might be in Firebook. I'm not sure. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Timmy. Glad to have you.